third day of KLF in this room and it's a presentation by <coughs> Dr. Iftikhar Salahuddin on Iran, a story of emperors and kings and uh, Dr. Iftikhar Salahuddin is uh, head and neck surgeon and he has, apart from his professional expertise, he has made his place as an avid photographer and uh, his work has been published in various magazines and newspapers and a very good presenter because last year we had uh, Jerusalem, A Journey Back in Time. He's also the author of this very fascinating book and uh, a play was also staged, uh, Karachi Arts Council and the Alhambra in Lahore on Jerusalem. And today we have a story of emperors and kings. The moderator for this session is Vice Admiral Khaled Emir retired and uh, he has had a very distinguished career having graduated and uh, commissioned from Britannia and Royal Naval College in Dartmouth where he was awarded the Sword of Honor and uh, a very distinguished career of 37 years with the Pakistan Navy having commanded numerous ships and also served as Chairman KPT. There's a whole list and I could go on and on, but I would like to say that he has uh, had a, a remarkable uh, career and uh, is a man of uh, many, uh, let's say, interests. He is also a recipient of Tamka Imtiyaz, Sitarai Basalat and Hilal Imtiyaz. So now over to Dr. Iftikhar Salahuddin. So I'm sure that you're going to enjoy this wonderful journey. Bismillah Allah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. I know it's a Sunday morning. It's very difficult for people to collect oneself to be here. And I'm so grateful on behalf of uh, Dr. Iftikhar and myself that you all are here to, uh, to hear what he has to say, which is a lot today, I'm sure. And uh, before we start that, I'm uh, uh, grateful to the organizer for having done most of my work. I was going to introduce Iftikhar in uh, less laurel terms, but she's done a lot to uh, introduce him, and uh, thank you so much, uh, the organizers. It's, um, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my proud privilege and an honor for me to be introducing you to a person who needs hardly any introduction to most of you all. Dr. Taha Salahuddin is a remarkable person indeed. Besides his deep study of history, he is also one of the best known ear, nose and throat surgeons in the business. While he repairs our ENT sensors and keeps the students at Aga Khan University busy, he still finds time to enlighten us on his many literary exploits and journeys. Some of us do travel to lands beyond where we see, we overeat, we strike funny poses for photographs, and on return, we stow it all away. But not Dr. Iftikhar. He reads history, visits history while on vacation, and then brings to life for all of us as he will be doing today. He is an ardent photographer whose work has been published in many magazines and newspapers. He is the author of the book, Jerusalem Journey Back in Time, which you just heard about. And last year, he shared the Peace Prize awarded at the Karachi Literary Festival by the Federal, Public, Federal Republic of Germany. And this is given to books which promote harmony and understanding in the world. The book is available in the stalls outside. Based on Dr. Iftakhar's photographs and narration, the play Jerusalem was staged at Karachi Arts Council and at Alhambra in Lahore, where it received much acclaim. He also presented Spain and its Islamic heritage from many other platforms at Karachi. Today he shall be taking us back to some very exciting periods of history of our great neighbor and brotherly country Iran. 
Dr. Sahar spent recently two weeks in Tehran preparing for this presentation. Starting from the empire of Cyrus the Great through to Darius, Xerxes, and the advent of Islam in Persia, he will take us on a journey right up to the revolution of Imam Khomeini. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would now like to welcome and invite Dr. Tarah Saladin to tell us all about kings and emperors. Thank you. Khaled, thank you for your kind words and it's a privilege to be introduced by a person of your eminence. And uh, I want to gratefully acknowledge the presence of Ambassador Jamshed Marker here. Thank you, Mr. Marker, for coming. <laughs> Lights ban kar dijega, please. Achha. Iran has a history longer than that of any other country and is considered to be world's oldest civilization. So it's difficult to decide where to begin the story of this ancient land and I chose to go back 2600 years to the 6th century BCE. And the reason I chose that was that was the start of the first empire of Persia. Let me give you some perspective of the period when the first Persian dynasty was established. Many significant events were happening in the West and also in the East. Western philosophy as we know it began in ancient Greece at that time and this was the pre-Socrates era, the era of Thales and Pythagoras. And in the West another important event was taking place. The Roman monarchy was overthrown and the Roman Republic was being established. And while these important events were taking a place in the West, in the East, Confucius philosophy was being founded in China and Buddha was spreading his word of enlightenment across India. Next door to Persia, in the Holy Land, Jews were facing a catastrophic situation because the Babylonians attacked them and burned down the temple of Solomon and forced the Israelites to flee Jerusalem. The strong and the intelligent were taken forcibly to Babylon and the rest of Israelites spread across the neighboring land. This was the beginning of the first diaspora of the Jews. It was in these times that the first Persian dynasty was established and this was the dynasty of the Ahmadid rule. It was founded by Cyrus the Great and the historians believe that the Ahmadid period is the beginning of the world history and that Cyrus is considered to be the first emperor of the world. And what an empire it was. It stretched all the way from the agency across Asia and all the way up to the lands familiar to us in River Indus. And this was the largest empire the world had seen at that time. Cyrus was the ultimate king and Cyrus remains central to the history of Persia. In the British Museum is a small clay cylinder called the Cyrus Cylinder on which is inscribed the world's first human right charter. And King Cyrus was a unique ruler who followed the Zoroastrian belief, a faith which preached compassion and justice. In Babylon, which was just next door to Persia, the Jews were being persecuted by the King Nabushadnezer. And he was a cruel king and Cyrus couldn't accept that. He declared war on Babylon. He freed the Jews, gave them gold and silver and asked him to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the destroyed temple. It is ironic that the Jews who once admired Persians as their benefactors today consider Iranians as their nemesis. To celebrate the many victories, 
Cyrus built the city of Pasargad. This is near the present day city of Shiraz and it was a city of lush gardens and fountains and each new Ahmadid king came here to be crowned. Today, Pasardad is no more. Only the ruins and the mausoleum of Cyrus remind us about the empire and the glory of the rule of the Ahmadids. Cyrus was succeeded by Darius the Great and he ruled the Ahmadid period at its peak and he moved the capital away from Pasargad and built a magnificent uh, city which the Greeks called the Persepolis which means the city of the Persians. This is what Persepolis looked like when it was built 2500 years ago and Persepolis reflects the glory of the Persian Empire and the Iranians still regard it as their national identity. And this is Persepolis today. It is a short drive from Shiraz and in the next few pictures there are images of the glorious rule of the Ahmadid that once was. Persepolis ranks as among the most historically significant ruins of the world and it is also the burial places of many Ahmadid kings. There is no written history of the Babylonians or the Ahmadids just as there is no written history of the Egyptians or the ancient Greeks. Mnemonics and memory was the rule of the day. Darius who built Persepolis is not buried in Persepolis but he was interred 30 kilometers away in the mountains of Naksharustam. And Naksharustam is also the resting place of many other Ahmadid kings, Xerxes, Ataxerxes, and other royals. Naksharustam was also sacked by Alexander, and nothing remains in the burial chambers today. After Darius, Persia was plunged into prolonged wars with the neighboring Greeks and these were called the Greco-Persian Wars which lasted for 20 years. In one of the wars, the Persians reached Athens and in a very savage move attacked the very icon of Greek history, the Acropolis and then they destroyed the Parthenon. It was completely burned down. The end to the Greek-Persian Wars came at the time of Alexander the Great and he marched across Babylonia and descended on to Persepolis. Alexander, the student of Aristotle and the man who worshipped at the altar of truth and beauty, in a very senseless act ordered the destruction of Persepolis as a revenge for the destruction of the Acropolis in Athens. Before Persepolis went up in flames, Alexander hauled the loot using 3,000 camels and horses and the spoils of war which consisted of precious stones and silver and gold were carted away by the Greeks. After Alexander, his, his general Seleucid ruled most of Iran but not the region of Fars where from this province rose a dynamic leader by the name of Ardeshir and he eventually founded the Sassanid dynasty. And the significance of Sassanid dynasty is that it was the last dynasty before Islam came to Persia. The Sassanid period is considered one of the most important periods in the history of Iran. And this was the period of the Renaissance of Persia. And the Sassanids ruled for 400 years from a city called Sassaphon, which is close to Baghdad today. The art which the Iran is famous for, the domes, the carpets and the miniatures did not originate in Muslim, Spain, Muslim Iran but they came from the pre-Islamic Sassanid period. The most magnificent carpet ever made by man was made in the rule of Khosrow 
and this was the emperor who ruled from Sesiphon and this carpet covered the floors of his palace in Sesiphon. It was made of gold, silver, precious and semi-precious stones. Emeralds were used to uh, describe the trees and pearls and rubies and sapphires were used to show the flowers. When the Arabs during the period of Hazrat Umar conquered Persia in the 7th century, this carpet was taken to Medina and they cut it into pieces and gave it to the soldiers, victorious soldiers of the Muslim army. The Sasanids like the Ahmadids are believers of Afur Mazda who gave the religion of Zoroastrianism. And this is the, these are the people who come from Iran to Pakistan and we call them Parsis because they came from Persia. The dominant faith of the Ahmadids and their rulers after that for 1000 years was the Zoroastrian faith. And beginning with Cyrus, this continued to be the official religion of Persia until Islam came to Iran. The city of Yazd is the city of the Zoroastrians. It is about like 30 kilometers, 300 kilometers from Isfahan and is the home of Iran's largest and most active population of the Zoroastrians who come to pray at this Atash Kadeh. Here the eternal flame has been burning for the last 700 years and not far from here is the burial places of the Zoroastrians. Generally speaking, the Iranian history has two periods. The one which is Islamic and the other pre-Islamic. I have highlighted the history of Iran before Islam came. There were other dynasties also in the pre-Islamic area, like the Seleucids, the Parthians and so many others. But the most important dynasties were the Ahmadids and the Sassanids. Those were the dynasties of kings and the belief was Zoroastrian. Just after passing away of our Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, the Arabs faced two mighty adversaries in the north. The Byzantines in the west and the Sasanians in the east. The Sasanians were at the peak and so were the Byzantines and they were at war with each other for so long that they sapped the energies and the Muslims waiting in the south were waiting for this opportunity to attack these two mighty empires. In 634, under Abu Bakr Siddiq, the Arabs humbled the Byzantines and occupied Syria and its capital Damascus. Persia was next and in the Khalifat of Hazrat Umar, the famous general Khalid bin Walid occupied and defeated, defeated the Sassanid armies and this happened at the famous place called Qadsiya. The Qadsiya victory led the Muslims to occupy Sesiphon in Mesopotamia and this city as I mentioned is just near the present city of uh, Baghdad. And now the entire Iran was being ruled by the Muslims. The great institutions before the Muslims came were monarchy and the Zoroastrian faith and both were swept away by the Muslims. Iran was ruled first from Medina and then for 90 years it was ruled from Damascus by the Umayyads. In time there was widespread uprising against the latter Khalifas of the Umayyad period and the Abbasids supported by the Persians from the region of Khorasan and these were the followers of Hazrat Ali and the Shia context in the Shia context here and they made Baghdad the new capital moving it from Damascus. The Muslim world from this point onward was root from Baghdad. The reality was that a distinct Persian ethos was now being ruled by Arabs who brought with them a new religion, a new culture and most importantly a new language. And over the next several centuries, the Persian language evolved along with the Arabic and eventually it acquired the Arabic script. The fusion of Persian and Muslim culture and language encouraged scholarship and philosophy in Iran. 
In the glorious period of the Muslim rule, during the Abbasid Khalif, uh, Caliphate of Al Mamun, a center of learning called Bayt al Hikmah was created in Baghdad. And at Bayt al Hikmah, it was mostly the Persians who enriched the science and the philosophy of the established place. There were several renowned Persian scholars, but two deserve some special recognition. Abu Sina from Bukhara and Uzbekistan, later he settled in Samarkand. And Al Razi, one of the greatest physicians of Islamic civilization. Just as the Umayyads had their downfall, the Abbasid governance in Iran over many years came unraveling. And the central authority was lost from Baghdad. The regional dynasties started sprouting up in the entire Persian history, Persian area. There were small minor governments like the Samanids of Bukhara, the Tahirids of Khorasan, the Ghaznavids from Ghazni, and the Sasanids from the area of Sistan. One of the significant result of this breakup was that the Persian language was losing its moorings with the Arabic language and was coming to its own. And during this period evolved the most sublime and fragrant poetry in the Persian language. The minor dynasties patronized the poets and the artists, just as in the later time, the Renaissance period, the popes would encourage and support the artists. In Iran, the Sultan of Ghaznavi patronized Abul Qasim Firdausi, and his magnum opus was Shahnameh, which means the story of the kings. The Shahnameh is an epic story of the kings of Persia who ruled before Islam came. And there were 50,000 verses in Shahnameh. And though written in the period of the Arabic influence, the language of Shahnameh is purely Persian, not a word of Arabic in, the Persia, in Shahnameh. And the book extols the period before Islam and is steeped in the Zoroastrian traditions. Ferdowsi in the book laments the coming of Islam to Persia and he kept the, sh the book Shahnameh keeps alive the stories of Persia before Islam came. And had there not been Shahnameh, one would have lost the history of pre-Islamic Iran from the, of the Sasanid period. The poignant stories of uh, Rustam and Sohrab and King Jamshed and Kaikos are some of the great stories and legends in the Shahnameh. It took Firdausi 30 years to write Shahnameh. And when this was completed, he presented it to the Sultan of Ghaznavi, who read these stories and was not impressed by the anti-Islamic or shall we say pre-pro-Zoroastrian the ideas and ethos of the book and he gave the writer a few gold coins. Firdausi came out and gave half the coins to the wine seller and the other half to the bath assistant. But later on when the Sultan of Ghaznavi really read the works of Firdausi, he was very impressed and he sent a camel load of gifts to uh, Firdausi but unfortunately as the camels bearing the gifts for the poet arrived from one gate of the city, his body was leaving through the gate to the other gate. The camels were then presented to the sister of uh, Firdausi, who refused the gifts from the Ghaznavi Sultan. When the Abbasid land was broken into several minor fiefdoms, a Tatar tribe originated from the east and these were called the Saljuks. They were ardent Sunnis and they came from steppes of Kazakhstan and they marched west into Iran and they didn't stop here but they went all the way into the Byzantine area of Tur which is present day Turkey. And later on from this tribe originated the tribe of Usmanli which is called the Ottoman Empire. So the Ottoman Empire came as the, these were the ancestors of the Ottoman Empire. The Seljuks gradually adopted, adopted the Persian culture and made Esfahan the capital. 
and they have left many important imprints on Iran and this is the city wall around the city of Kashan but the artistic legacy is best seen in the city of the capital Isfahan. The 11th century was the brilliant period of Islamic creativity in Iran and the Jama Masjid in Isfahan made in the period of the Sajuks reflects the great architectural richness of the period. The mosque is near the bazar e bozirk which is the old mosque of Isfahan and the Seljuk architecture is depicted by the bricks, the very heavy on the brick architecture and here's another example of the use of bricks in the many halls of the Jamia Masjid. The intricate calligraphy on the bricks in the Mehrab is also from the period of the Seljuks. The Seljuks also were patrons of art and literature and a profusion of poets and more importantly Sufis flourished in the period of the Seljuks. The most well-known poet was Umar Khayyam and he was from Nishapur and the British person who translated his work Fitzgerald, he has reduced his work and he has trivialized it to that of eat, drink and be merry hedonism. Khayyam was a serious writer and a scientist and a creator of the moon is named after Khayyam. And most importantly he wrote on the free will and he was against the orthodoxy. In the same period Al Ghazali, an artist and the philosopher flourished in the period of Sajuk and he was a diehard orthodox and he was from Khorasan. And one of the most influential Muslims after they say Prophet Muhammad. And his philosophy of orthodox Islam and his opposition to the Greek philosophy proved detrimental to the progress of science in the history of Muslims. That was the 11th century. The Seljuks ruled for 100 years and towards the end of the 12th century the Seljuk Empire was ultimately broken up and splinter groups called the Khwarzim Shahs erupted all over the area. In the 13th century another great power rose from Mongolia and the leader was Chinggis Khan. Chinggis Khan sent messengers to the Khwarzim Shahs of Iran and in one message which was received by a minor Khwarzim Shah the ruler blackened the face of the delegates of Chinggis Khan and sent them away in disgrace. Chinggis Khan was not to be trifled with. He immediately attacked the region and completely destroyed the cities of Bukhara, Samarkand, Merv and swept into Khorasan and occupied Persia and made Tabriz as the capital of the Chinggis. The Mongols occupied Iran under three kings or shall we say rulers. First was under Chinggis Khan, then came Halaku Khan and in the 14th century came the Tamir Lane. Now this is how the Mongols travel. They have a big uh, group of uh, soldiers and interestingly the soldiers moved in groups of ten or hundreds or thousands like an Hazar and the descendants of the Mongols in Pakistan who are called Hazaras are because of this that they, these people moved in, in groups of thousands. That's the, how the name Hazaras came for them. The Mongols have a notorious uh, image but ironically the Persian poetry and art and importantly Sufism continued to blossom in the period of the Mongols. Three great Persian poets were in, upon the period of the Mongols. One was uh, Rumi, Sadi and Hafiz. They, f they flourished in a period when people did not think much about the Mongols and let's look at them individually. Rumi the Mevlana was a poet and a Sufi from Balkh area and his message transcends the geographical and religious boundaries and Masnavi was his great work and is uh, remembered and is read across the world. He lived most of his life 
under the Mongols and finally migrated to Anatolia province and in the Ottoman lands he acquired a large fame and following. His work is very familiar to the West. In fact, uh, the wisdom of Rumi is enshrined on the portals of United Nations. And the Mevlana is buried in Konya. And uh, on his grave, the epitaph reads, When we are dead, seek not our tomb in the earth, but find it in the hearts of men. The other celebrated poet was Sadi and he was born in Shiraz and most of his uh, work is in uh, beautiful Persian but he his work is read by the Persian students and schools and universities to improve the quality of the language his two important works are Bostan and Golistan and it is taught in every single institution of Iran uh, educational institution Sadi is buried in Shiraz on the outskirts of the city and his mausoleum is visited by the young and old who come and read his work and spend time and to enjoy in the beautiful gardens of the place. A century, 100 years after Sadi came another great poet called Hafiz and Hafiz also was from Shiraz and is called Hafiz Shirazi and his magnum opus was called the Divan and almost every Iranian home has a copy of the Divan and that is not just for the love of poetry but they use the book as a fal and they consult it when important decisions in families have to be made. Hafiz once wrote a very controversial poem against the orthodoxy and he was promptly accused of blasphemy and he was declared as an infidel and a non-Muslim. And this is how he countered it. O zealots, think not that you are sheltered from the sin of pride. For the difference between the mosque and the infidel church is but vanity. Although the poet was a Hafiz, he was denied burial in the Muslim graveyard. And finally the people consulted his divan and then they accepted his beliefs and they allowed him a decent burial in this beautiful place here. Hafiz always wanted his burial place to be open and surrounded by trees so that people could visit him more often. That was the period of poets and Sufis. After the Mongols of the 15th century, Iran was a predominantly Sunni country. And from the Ottoman Empire came students to learn at the Madaris in Iran and learn about the Sunni faith. All that changed in the early 16th century when a militant brotherhood from the city of Arbil, Ardabil marched into the land of the Mongols and the Saljuks. And the brotherhoods were named the Safavids after the late leader Sheikh Safi. And these were, they established a dynasty called the Safavi dynasty. And this is not to be confused with the Sassanid dynasty. Sassanid was the pre-Islamic dynasty. Safavi is the first Muslim dynasty. For Sassanids, these, uh, the Safavids uh, were Sunnis, but you know, in the 16th century, the leader was Shah Ismail. And Shah Ismail was the leader of the Safavids who proclaimed Shiaism of the 12 Imam faith as the official belief of Iran. And he just not announced it as a belief, but he forcibly introduced Shiaism in Iran. And he forcibly converted Sunnis into the faith. And he introduced the offensive tradition of Tabara in which the denunciation of the first three Imams was done. He even banned the Sufism, calling it a heresy. Iran under Shah Ismail and other Sunni empires on, had a Sunni empires on both sides. Here was the Sh Shia uh, Safavid Empire. On, on the west was the Byzantine and the Ottoman Empire. The Ottomans were of course Sunni. And on this side, on the east, was the Mughal Empire of India. They were also Sunni. And the Ottomans were hemmed in 
on one side by the Fatimid Egypts who were also Shias and on the other side by the Safavids who were Shias. So here was the Sunni empire being hemmed in by these two Shia faiths. So the Ottomans decided to do something about it and instead of taking on the Fatimids first, they attacked the Safavid empire and uh, they defeated the Safavids but they did not occupy any part of Iran. In Isfahan, this is a beautiful monument called the Chehel Sutun, the 40 pillars, and it was once the palace of the Safavids, and in it is a massive fresco of the war between the Ottomans, Salim I, and the Safavid emperor. Here is the war called the war of Shaldirin. This is between the Ottomans and the Persians in which the Ottomans defeated the Persians. In the Safavi dynasty, the most celebrated ruler was not Shah Ismail, but it was Shah Abbas. Shah Abbas moved the capital to Isfahan, where today we see the most impressive gallery of Islamic architecture in the world. The entire grandeur of Isfahan is from the period of Shah Abbas, who ruled Iran for 40 years. The present government of Ayatollahs have changed all the names in Isfahan associated with Shah Abbas and they are named after the, after the present Imams. naqsh -e jahan is the heart of Isfahan. It is a large maidan around which are located the jewels of Persian architecture. And the name of naqsh -e jahan has now been changed to the Imam Square. School children come here to see their history and young women come for a break in the peaceful places of the naqsh -e jahan At dusk, the fountains give the plaza a surreal appearance and the Shah Abbas Mosque called the Imam Mosque is an enchanting sight. At night, the bazaar in one of the souks resembles one from the fables of Thousand and One Nights. But the most beautiful mosque in Iran is the magnificent Shah Lutfullah Mosque, which retains its original name. The mosque is finished in blue tiles and is truly an icon of Persian and Islamic art. I will let you enjoy some of the beautiful sights and images of the mosque. This is the peacock ceiling of the Lutfullah Mosque. When this light comes in this place, you can see this is the peacock and the reflection, white reflection, almost resembles like the tail of the peacock here. It's also called the Peacock Dome. Isfahan is called Nisfe Jahan, half the world. It's a peaceful city of sprawling gardens and rivers and the pristine beauty of the Hashte Behisht garden are crowded with young and old who come to spend time in the afternoon and the only thing that disturbs them is the cooing of the nightingales. I fell in love with Isfahan and I always decide to move to Isfahan when I retire from Pakistan. The Chahar Bagh promenade is the main street of uh, Isfahan and in the center are wide boulevards in the center and the manicured gardens all around it. There is an old caravansarai which was called the Shah Abbas Hotel and now it is simply called the Abbasid Hotel. The imposition of the Shiite ideology by the Safavids bred intolerance against the Sufis and also against the Zoroastrians and the Jews. And after the passing away of Shah Abbas, the Safavid empire lasted only for about a century, but the stagnation had already set in and a vast chunk of the land was lost to the Ottomans. The end to the glorious Safavid rule came at the hands of a Sunni Afghan and he was from Kandahar and he occupied Persia.
but it was a very short lived rule and only a few years later he was routed by an ultra nationalist iranian and he was a warlord and he was called nadir kuli and in the history he is remembered as nadir shah and nadir shah was an iranian not an afghan nadir shah reoccupied isfahan and he marched on to avenge the afghans in herat which is now in afghanistan of course he declared himself king and in one farman ordered the cessation of all shia practices in iran including the tabarra and he also banned the ashura procession in iran he confiscated all the shia mosques and imposed the rule of sunnis again in iran he became very popular with the sunni troops and he wanted to give the image to the world that iran is now a new country with a new ideology and new politics especially to ingratiate himself with the ottomans after occupying kandahar and kabul nadir shah accused india of harboring his enemies and in hot pursuit he headed for delhi emperor shah ahmed rangila mamma shah rangila was on the throne and he made nadir shah wait for one full year before granting him audience and nadir shah did not like that he promptly occupied lahore and later peshawar in peace he was merciful but in war he was ruthless and he killed about like 30000 troops in india mamad shah rangila finally sued for peace and granted him all the land west of the indus to him after a few years he returned from india and nadir shah was killed in his own country and he is buried in mashhad nadir shah looted the treasures of the moguls especially the peacock throne is famous and this throne was originally made by shah jahan in the 17th century and many mogul kings sat on it and it was embellished with uh, rubies precious stones and semi precious stones and after nadir shah was assassinated the peacock throne disappeared apparently it was cut into many pieces and sold but this is the replica of the peacock throne in the gulistan palace in tehran Nadir Shah troops also carried away a famous diamond by the name of Daryae Noor and more famous than that was the Kohe Noor. Kohe Noor which means the mountain of light was mined in Golconda in Hyderabad Dakkan. It was taken from Nadir Shah by a warlord whose name was Durrani and he brought the diamond back into India to negotiate with the Sikhs to get his help and also his money. while the diamond was in punjab under the rule of the sikhs the british india company got to know about it and they forcefully took the diamond from the sikhs and they presented it to the empress victoria and this diamond is still in the throne in the crown of the british uh, government and uh, interestingly it still weighs 180 carats it was never cut After the death of Sunni ruler Nadir Shah, Iran would not remain Sunni for very long. And the next dynasty called the dynasty of Zand, they restored the Shia faith, and all over Iran and outside world, they proclaimed Shiaism as their official language and they made Shiraz as the capital. The story of dynasties continues, and after Zand came the Khajar dynasty. which spent enormous amount of money and time and resources on purposeless luxuries and the famous qajar ruler fatih shah splurged the national wealth on hedonistic pleasures diplomatically also he was not very lucky and it was a disastrous rule for iran because under fatih shah raged the famous russian prussian war persian war which resulted in the annexation of georgia Azerbaijan and Armenia However not all contributions of the Qajar dynasty were frivolous here is the Nasirul Mulk mosque in Shiraz which was built in the days of the Qajar and is a fine example of exquisite design and art it is also called the pink mosque because much of the interior is finished in pink tiles
Khadr dynasty moved the capital to Tehran. The city of Tehran is a vibrant city today and uh, it is located in the shadows of the Alborz mountains. The main Khomeini airport is modern. The domestic flights we took were perfect. The highways can be compared to those of any developed country. And the traffic pattern is chaotic, but you don't see police at every corner. Only an occasional policeman is seen. No VIP movements, no visible guns, and no beggars on the streets of Tehran. Posters like this are all over Iran, and they remind the woman that observing veil is the law of the land. But compliance to this diktat is very loose and young couples holding hands can be seen on the streets of Tehran and they will be equally at home in New York. And it is a fashion galore. And you can't be faulted if you think you are not in Tehran but you are in, in uh, Rome or in Paris. This is Oud Couture but still within the strictures of the law of the land. She has a head covered. That's the most important uh, requirement in the Iranian law. You must have the head covered. Women are not just fashion conscious, but they are conscious of the looks. Here too, the women, she just had a rhinoplasty done and they don't mind sporting the dressing. And you see a lot of women and men walking in the streets of uh, Iran with the dressings on the nose. And they say they have just come out from the Bimaristan, which is the name of the hospital, the, the Persian Persian hospitals are called the Bimaristan and to distinguish them from the psychiatric institutions which are called the Timaristan. So people are very careful they say we are from Bimaristan not from Timaristan. Young couples in Iran uh, can always find a rendezvous whether in a traditional restaurant like this where they can sit on the floor or on the takht or they can go to the hill stations in Caspian. Thursday nights is where the music starts and the weekend begins. In the traditional places, uh, the diners settle on the takht and they can order the chillu kebab there and the lassi. And for those who are, do prefer the western ambience, uh, there are exquisite and romantic restaurants where you can order the Chateaubriand steak and wash it down with non-alcoholic red wine. But for sheer opulence and the grandeur of the Khajar period, one must visit the palace of Golestan. And this was built in the period of the Khajar kings. From the vibrant exterior to the hall of chandeliers, the palace walls are finished in colored glasses through which streams sunlight. And the hall of mirrors has witnessed many state functions. And the hall of marble is where the first Pehlvi king, the father of the last Shah of Iran was crowned. The last Shah desired a more ornate place for his coronation and he was uh, crowned in this room. Here is my wife Naseem, she is a queen but queen without a crown. The emperors and kings of Iran gave and received priceless jewels during the reign and these imperial crown jewels are now stored in the basement of the Iran Milli Bank. And these collections include from the Safavid era, these, uh, the Nadir Shah collections and from the Khajar period. And here you can see that Queen Victoria is wearing a pendant on which is the photograph of one of the Khajar kings. In 1901, one of the rulers of the Khajar dynasty, Muzaffaruddin Shah, gave oil concessions of the entire country of Iran to the British for a period of 50 years and for a paltry sum of 40,000 pounds only. But the later kings of the Khajar dynasty were not as pliant as Muzaffaruddin and the British promptly removed the kings and appointed in its place an army officer by the name of Raza Khan who was the father of the 
present Shah of Iran. The, um, the king, the general lost no time in declaring himself as the first Shah of the Pahlavi dynasty. And he changed the name of the country from Persia and to the name of Iran, which was the original name of the land. His idol was Mustafa Kamal Pasha. Although he didn't have the stature and the popularity of Kamal Ataturk, he was enamored by the Western ways and of the secularism. And he wanted uh, to cut the knot of the Safavids between the state and the religion. Raza Shah often walked in the Ashura procession with straw on his head to show his piety. But um, he also made sure that a military band followed him playing <coughs> the Chopin's funeral. So he wanted to live in both worlds. You know. He emancipated the women by banning the chador and ordered them and all the men and women to put on their western dress. He banned the chador and veil in cinemas and restaurants and the women were ordered and the women were ordered to either stay home or leave the veils behind. But during the Second World War, Raza Khan committed a crime which was unforgivable by the, by the British. He sided with Hitler and that was a sin the British could never forgive. And he was promptly ousted and they brought his son, Muhammad Raza, as the new king. Muhammad Raza became king in 1941 and he restored to the Iranian dynasty most of the freedom his father had taken away. And he gave the women back their chadwars and he reintroduced the Shia traditions of Ashura. And while he was an uh, ultra-nationalist, he was quite unpopular in the West. The son was influenced by the West and he played to the tune of the British and the Western world. When the new Shah came, the British were in business again and had the monopoly of the Anglo-American company restored to the British and the British took the oil from Iran at a throwaway price to fuel the warships. The nationalists in Iran were incensed that the wealth was being looted by the West and the popular Tudeh party which was headed by Musaddiq swept into power and the Shah was forced to appoint Musaddiq as the Prime Minister of Iran. Musaddiq introduced mono, uh, democracy in uh, Iran, clipping the wings of Shah and his sister Ashraf. He nationalized the entire oil industry, which the British needed very badly. The British Prime Minister Churchill convinced President Roosevelt that Musaddiq was a Russia-loving communist and had to go. The MI6 and the CIA launched a rebellion against Musaddiq and the operation Ajax was headed by a person no less than the son of the American President Roosevelt. His name was Kemet Roosevelt. Mossadegh was ultimately overthrown in this coup and the Shah of Iran was brought back to power. Mossadegh was given life sentence. He died three years later in captivity but he still lives in the heart of all Iranians. The Shah first became the king in 1941, but the coronation of the Shah took place in the Grand Hall of the Gulistan Palace in 1976, which is about 26 years later. He was asked why he waited this long to be crowned as Shah in Shah. He said there was no glory in being crowned in a country of poor people. The Shah greatly admired Napoleon and emulated him at his own coronation. Napoleon at that time took the crown from the Pope and placed it on his own head and the Shah took the crown from an Ayatollah and placed it on his head also. And then in a move which is reminiscent of the French Emperor who is shown here about to place the crown on Josephine. The Shah Iran also placed a crown on Faradiba's head. The crown for the Empress was designed by one Cleef and Arpels 
and now rests in the collection of Iran's national assets. The Shah was a despotic ruler who brought prosperity to Iran but at the expense of the freedom of the Iranian people. He was very close to the Western nations and not to his own people or to the clergy. And his arrogance and megalomania is reflected in the celebrations of the 2500 year anniversary of the Ahmadinejad Empire in 1972. He considered himself the descendant of the Ahmadinejad dynasty and he arrived in Persepolis for this event. The grand celebrations uh, came to Pasag he, uh, he, the king came to Pasagad and to offer his tribute to Cyrus and to announce to the world that he is a descendant of the Ahmadinejad king. He invited emperors, kings and presidents. Luxurious tents were prepared for the guests and the banquet was an affair to remember catered by the maxims of Paris and crystals of Baccarat and the wine from Tuscany and Chianti provinces in Italy. He reveled in the company of those who attended and matter, uh, those who mattered in the world but little did he know that when he would seek the help that he would not be offered any. The winds of change were happening in Iran and Ayatollah Khomeini's revolution was in the air. Ayatollah Khomeini came to Iran in 1979 and the future of the king was sealed. Two more minutes. The Shah left Iran on his personal plane and his supporters knew what would happen to them. Here the officers touching the feet of the Shah beseeching him not to leave the country. He applied for a uh, place in Egypt but was denied and he finally, no, he, in Mexico and United States, asylum but he was denied and finally he found asylum in Egypt where he is buried in a s small mosque or the Rafai mosque. And here is the Shah buried in Egypt and uh, he was buried unwept, unhonored and unsung. I went to Cairo in 1991 and I couldn't find where the Shah was buried. It was a simple grave then. Now his wife and his family grieve for him. Last month I happened to be in Rangoon and I paid my respects to another exiled king, Bahadur Shah Zafar. The poet king in captivity was denied the pen and, and paper. So he wrote all his verses on the walls. In keeping to revive the tradition to remember this, a uh, lot of his work is now written on the walls of the uh, burial site and the one lament which he wrote also applies to the Shah of Iran. Kitna hai bad naseeb zafar dafin ke liye do gaz zameen bhi mil na saki kue yaar mein. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Salahuddin, for a very, very interesting and completely uh, uh, over to Khalid Misa for a reminder and we'll start the next session after this. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure you'll all join me in uh, congratulating Dr. Iftikhar for having given us such a wonderful lecture today. <laughs> the amount of research that went into this, I'm sure, must be, have been enormous. And I congratulate him and his family for having been with him throughout. And you've amply seen it on the screen today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, we haven't got time for the question and answer. I'm sure a number of you would be looking forward to it. But the organizers have just told us that we're running out of time. So thank you so much for coming. It's been a great pleasure to have you as an audience. We hope to meet again. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>